This is dedicated to anyone that's been knocked down, but not out. The ones that fell to their knees, but rose back up. The ones that scratched and clawed, but never let go. The ones willing to admit their faults, move past their failures, and improve every single day. I hope these conversations encourage you to think critically, make you laugh hysterically, inspire you profoundly, and remind you to practice gratitude daily. My name is Iman Hushmat. Welcome to the conversation. Welcome to Awesome People. Awesome people, what's up and good evening to another podcast episode. What a pleasure to have all of you watching here tonight. It's going to be a great, great, great program. Uh, I was about to do a very normal intro, but then literally 30 seconds ago, we lost Sammy. And so we're going to loop him back in in a second. But in the meantime, while that's happening, don't worry, guys, he's coming. It's all good because I know a lot of you have been looking forward to this uh, conversation. And so have I. Salman uh, Sammy, as he goes by more popularly, is uh, a longtime friend of mine. And he's done some incredible things since I first met him about 15 years ago. And I was so excited to have this opportunity to have this candid conversation with him so that uh, anyone who doesn't know him on a deeper level will hopefully uh, get to know him on that level because uh, he's actually a very interesting human being. He's very enigmatic. He's very private. And so I'm hoping that tonight we can go a few layers deep and have a great conversation. And, um, and so, yeah, so while I kind of look around and ask my production team, what's going on with Salman. Uh, I want to also take a moment and say hello to all of Sammy's friends. You guys have been messaging me a lot. Uh, I know you're looking forward to this uh, interview. There's a lot of questions that you guys had, and I loved a lot of your questions, and I hope to be able to squeeze them into this interview. Uh, And also for all the fans that are from Iran or the ones that don't speak English, I'm going to speak for about 20 seconds in Farsi uh, to acknowledge you. Uh, So give me a give me a second to all my non Farsi speakers. Actually, hold on, Anush. This is someone. Can you can you make sure you talk talk to him and see what's going on? So, this is what happens, guys, when you're on live. So, someone is uh, getting back connected right now. Um, so, um, what I want to say actually to the Iranians uh, guests over here or viewers, awesome people. Awesome سخنرایی همش انگلیسی خواهد بود چون که شنونده من بیشتر ایرانی آمریکایی هستن و ما میخوایم که این فرهنگ ایرانی و آمریکایی بیاریم به همدیگه بچسبه برای همینه که اگر شما فکر میکردین که برنامه تو فارسی خواهد بود شرمنده ولی امیدوارم که بازم بتونین لذت ببریم و تا چند دقیقه دیگه سامانم برمیگرده روی صحنه uh, or at least the virtual صحنه uh, okay so now going back to english i see that we're reconnecting with sammy we good now? Yeah. All right. See, this is what happens on live TV, guys. <laughs> I love it. All right. So, you know what, ladies and gentlemen, the, the guest that I have for this evening's Awesome People episode is a man that does not require any kind of introduction whatsoever. If anything, to those who are watching, are here to watch him, and you don't know me. So, my name is Iman. It's a pleasure to uh, host this conversation. And without any further ado, it's my longtime friend and quite possibly the coolest, awesomest pop rock star in the Persian community all around the world. So please help me welcome Sammy Beggy. What's up, Salman? Hello, hello, Iman Juan. How are you? I'm good, man. Did you decide to back out last second all of a sudden? Is that what no, happened? Uh, just tell tell your uh, listeners and viewers that I had, had prepared a nicest fireplace for them on my, uh, in the back. Oh, yeah. What and happened? <laughs> It just went black on me. I had to change the charger. I'm moving, and this is just a big mess here. <laughs> it's all good, man. I'm sure they're here to see you I anyways. Yeah, no, man. Well, uh, I'm, I'm so appreciative of you making time uh, to join us. I haven't seen you in, like, so many years, but uh, in between, we've stayed in touch, man. So let me just kind of ask you, um, it's been an interesting past 12 months for many of us. Uh, how has it been for you? Because I know you don't do too many of these interviews, so I appreciate you making time to chat with me. So Always fill, for you, man. Always. fill your friends and your family and your uh, followers in on how your past year has been, man. Well, basically, uh, it hasn't been any different from anybody else. We've been, uh, we've all been involved with the with this virus and uh, everything has been shut down. I don't need to explain to people, but the, the way I've been dealing with it is just to, uh, just to start with, I'm a very private person. You know that I don't do anything. I, I just, uh, I'm just at home in my own private space. So for me, basically I've been 
used to this for the past 20 years. So I've been rehearsing for the pandemic, maybe. But um, for me, it's just be seeing seeing people around you suffer and uh, uh, just losing losing people close to me. We just lost a very dear friend of mine, the, the soccer player in Iran. Mehdad. Uh, you know, and yes, uh, two days ago, and it just broke my heart. He was a very, very close friend to me. Uh, always catching up, always uh, asking how I am and stuff uh, from Iran. Um, so it's hard. And before that, I um, I lost another friend. Um, I don't mean to, to start it as a negative note, but I just lost another friend too in, in Toronto. So Danny. Yes. Um, Danny. The, the past few months have been really hard for me personally, but we're coping with it. I know there's a lot of people that are going through way worse than me and way worse than people around me. So uh just keeping strong man just keeping strong it's good to see you and good to good to see old friends and this is a this is a good good thing likewise man we're gonna have a great time uh together man and we're gonna reflect on a lot of positive things but you know when 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 hard things happen <laughs> the best thing is to talk about it to be able to share those experiences to be there for one another so my condolences to you for both danny and mehtar i know i know they both had an impact on you uh, i saw i saw just how emotional that you were last night and Really, it's it's your raw and your authentic and your your human element that I've always appreciated about you. That no matter how big of a rock star you were becoming, there's always that 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 uh, that groundedness in you and that realness, you know. And a lot of people they usually um, there's a big difference between a regular person and then a superstar. But you once again show just how grounded you are, how how regular regular person you are. And I'm sure that all of your friends and fa followers appreciated you um, showing that raw moment. So Ruish Rashad, man, and good for you, dog. Yeah, I'm, I'm uh, just like you said. I keep I I try to I try, try to keep my my personal emotions away from away from my persona or whatever. But that's that's why I don't I'm not so active on social media because. Um, it's, if there's nothing to say, why even say anything? You know, in these days, I don't, I don't know if uh, every, everybody's trying to deal with, all, with their own problems, and I didn't, I, I couldn't do anything. And just that was just a raw moment, I guess, a few days ago that uh, I, I, I wanted to say something, but I just couldn't say anything, and it's just uh, so heartbreaking. And my condolences to all the Persian people and his family in Iran. Definitely, and, uh, I really hope that. Uh, next year will be better with the with the vaccinations and everything will uh will open up and i don't know what to say man it's just it's just heartbreaking it is man and, I, and i'm i'm going to be optimistic as well that this that this year is going to be better for everybody and uh hopefully it, it includes you being on stage more often and bringing joy and happiness to people because i know that that at the core is what you do everything for you know you do it to bring that happiness but why don't we just kind of like go back a little bit and and you kind of just share with people like where, where did this love affair with music and performing and and writing uh, you know where where did, what was the catalyst did you come from a family of musicians and artists or what what got you in love with this performance aspect well um the, the singing part comes from my dad he was he was he was always the one in the family that had a good voice and would sing in the, in the parties like we always have that one person in our families that always did, does that. Uh, right. So that came from that. And uh, basically in my teenage years, uh, uh, when, when I, I, I grew up in Sweden, I, as the people know, it was a little bit of conflict between my identities to go to the more more to have the Swedish identity and to have uh, the Persian identity. And right in that moment, I think something happened. I got involved with a few Persian musicians in Stockholm, and that changed my my. I was into music, but I was easily going to go to the to the other way and start rapping and maybe producing more, because right. I was always into instruments. But uh, getting to know these uh, Persian musicians is just uh, woke up something in me that like I got flashbacks from my from my dad singing Persians and all these traditional songs and stuff. So um, it just sparked in something in me that the passion came through my, my interest in music. So that added to it. So I got passionate about it before it was interest. But when I started doing Farsi and started doing Persian music, it got, it got, I got more passionate because then I thought that there were some new elements that I could add up to it. So basically from there, uh, I couldn't do anything else. I couldn't focus on anything else. Like every, every career, everything I, I would pursue would end up in me singing again. And uh, as you know, before, before me even going 
singing, like wanted to sing. You remember, we, we, we were always sit, sit down and hang out every night. And I was I always had to have the uh, guitar and play, you know? So uh, that was that was the thing. That was my go-to. That was the thing people knew me for. Sammy, the one that has a guitar and sings. <laughs> yeah. No, of course. And, I, and honestly, the best memories that I have with you are in my basement, like my 25th birthday, you rocking out the guitar, and I'm on Asma, which two is still... Two years ago, huh? Your 25th birthday, two oh, years ago. <laughs> yeah, two, year, two years ago, just a few years back. But, uh, and, and like, and still, I feel like I'm on Asma is one of the most like overseen tracks that you ever have it's like a hidden jewel that you have to dig really really deep because it came out so early in your career and so even the, your diehard fans might have not really stumbled upon it until much much later and it's just a it's such a i don't want to say simple to like belittle the song but it's such a simple song to me but so powerful so amazing and like it's, it's truly one of my favorite songs of yours and i'm still hoping that one day and you should come to miami that we make a music video for that because i'm pissed off that you don't actually have a music video do a remake or, on one as one, yeah. oh man it'll be amazing but um so here, here's my question to you first of all like how uh, do you do you consider yourself fortunate the fact that at such a young age you pretty much were destined for what to do like does that kind of take pressure off of like well i now know what i'm going to do and that's it and you just got to grind 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 because there's a lot of people in their 20s 30s 40s that they still don't know what the hell to do with their life you know and it's it really causes depression anxiety uh insecurities so do, do you look at it as like yeah i'm actually pretty lucky that uh i knew at 14 what i'm destined for or was there actually like a or was that actually hard knowing that there was so much pressure for you to basically do this? So how do you view it? Well, well, in retrospect, I think uh, I feel blessed because because I did something I, I did something that I liked and I'm still doing it, you know, because uh, there's a lot of people that change careers. There are a lot of people that get cold and there are a lot of key people that uh, can't cope with the uh, different ups and downs of, of this business. So right. in retrospect, yeah, I, I feel fortunate that it happened to me very early, but it, it has it has had it, its uh, ups and downs and in hard moments too. So um, I I wish that uh, you know sometimes this is this is the point we we came this path, but it could have been easier and it could have been more smooth and it could have could have been more professional if we only had been in our own country, because right. we're in exile right now. So everything is so much harder, and people don't understand that that's it's so much harder to do stuff in exile. It's psychologically, you don't have the support, you don't have the people. And it's just hard to just come into a new society and just living and surviving in a new society. Nevertheless, just making it and becoming something and becoming an entrepreneur or becoming a musician or becoming famous is so hard. Yeah. And this is these are the pressures that people don't see. And this is are the pressures that I've seen a lot of artists that come out of Iran and they go back or they can't make it here it's because of they they can't feel it it's just a struggle just to make it and just to survive and just to ment be mentally healthy when you're in exile when you're in when you're out of your own country and out of your environment so we're we're just swimming against the stream all the time and just uh, for me I, I feel fortunate that i've done it and i know how it is and i didn't give up that's the only thing no for sure and like you know, for you to say it at your level, you know, like you've already made it, like it just goes to show just how difficult it is for any artist, especially. No, it's still in, a you struggle. Know. It's still yeah, a it's struggle. struggle. There's no different. There's never you made it. I don't feel like I've made it or I, yeah. I don't feel like anybody has made it, <laughs> you know, yeah. even because you can't make it. I, I, you can't. But it's so much harder. Like you're you're comparing 80 million people to just maybe two or three yeah. million that are outside the country. Yeah. And how you don't know how to market yourself. You don't know how to market yourself over there or market yourself here. And I've been a performer since day one. You know that. So I, yeah. for me, it's the performance that matters. For me, I do. I write music to be able to perform it on stage. Right. And what's my audience? 2,000 people that are also in exile outside of Iraq. No, for sure. So actually, that, that actually leads me to another question that I have is that when you when you knew that this is going to be your career, did you ever consider to go to like the non Persian market or uh, like, is that ever something that you even tried to go after? Or from the very beginning, you're like, you know what, I'm going to climb this Persian mountain. I'm going to go to the top and I'm going to do my best. And I hope that one day I can perform in front of thousands of thousands. Was that the mindset? Yes. yes. So 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 your so your end goal is in the hopes that Iran's situation no, improves. I couldn't. I had. To, I I know that for me, in order for me to be successful, I have to stay true to myself and my my roots. 
Right. And I can't pretend to be something else and be good at it. I have to be good at it, at being myself. So when you're good at being yourself, then it, people can accept you. But you right. can't pretend to be good at something. So uh, after 15 years in this business, maybe in the next two, three years, I'll do an English song or a Swedish song mm-hmm. or try to try to cross over in that market. But I couldn't start with that. I just had to build my identity. I had to have my own people behind me first. Then I can cross over to another business. I respect that. So um, I guess my 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 next question is that when you were when you were uh, starting your career off, was there anybody in the Persian community as an artist that you were like looking up to, or were you from the get go be like, I got my own style, I'm gonna do my own thing, I'm a I'm a songwriter, not like an arrogant way, but just like, was there anybody that you're like, you know what, I can't wait to le- reach that level? Because when I think of uh, anybody that would be somewhat comparable would be Siova Shams in the late 80s, early 90s, that he was like a sex symbol. He was like the a real, the first real pop star, in my opinion, in the Persian community. And then I look at you and I see nobody else at your level with the type of like the look and the feel and the style. Like, you know, like there's a lot of wannabes and I don't blame them. It's just like they're not in their own self yet, but you are so yourself, you know? And like, is there anybody that you considered as like uh, somebody that you want to like, like, you know, Michael Jordan, LeBron wanted to kind of be better than him or something. What, did you have that or no? Oh, of course, I idolized a lot of people growing up, but not not, not the d- details of the cur- career, but the longevity of their careers. Like I look up to people that have done it for 35 years and been on stage for 35 years. I admire people that did something in Iran and disappeared for seven, eight years and came back and were on top again. These These are the legends for me. Like right. I can I can name a few. I can name like Dariush, Evi Gugush. These people were, were superstars and then they had to like cut it off for what, 10 years, 15 years, and they had to move and they had, but they came back, they they held their identity, they, they didn't lose faces in front of the people, people still love them. These are a lot of things that social media is messing up for artists right now. Mm. Because people, you overexpose yourself. You, when you overexpose yourself, there's a li- limited screen time you have for people. If you, ch- right. you use your screen time for people, people get used to your face every day on social media. They, they have no reason to admire you and come see you on concerts and look forward to your next thing. Because I think the, the relationship I have with, with my fans is that they, I don't need to be in their face all the time. They're in their hearts and they know and they listen to me and they, they wait for my stuff. Without a, even a story a year, I, I've never done an Instagram story of myself <laughs> talking to you know. If there's anything yeah. that I, I want to put through, I put through. But if not, this not this overexposure, I think is really unnecessary. So I admire people that kept themselves classy yeah. and kept themselves always desi- desirable for the people. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I think it goes back to just being yourself. You're comfortable in your own skin. And like it, you're, you're just somebody who doesn't feel the need to be all up on social media. You know, and it's definitely something that I've noticed throughout the years that you're very like you curate, you curate your content very like uh, carefully, you know, like and that's and, and so and I think I'm not it, very smart and picky about it. I just share whatever comes to my mind. If it's two, two pictures a day, maybe one day is three pictures. Yeah. Maybe there's no pictures for like five years or like three months. Doesn't matter. So uh, there's no obligation. I try to try to keep it real with with people, and I think thank God that this is what kept kept me alive. <laughs> Let me ask you something. Are are you glad that you're an artist that grew in a generation where social media was such a powerful tool to promote yourself, or would you have preferred to be exactly who you are 20 years ago without social media? But for me, I, I'm not dependent on it. Like, really, it's to, for me, social media is like a TV channel. It's like something that I, that I watch for entertainment. It's for, for my information only. I only take information from it. I don't add anything to it. You know what I mean? So mm-hmm. it's, I, don't, I don't feel involved. I'm a user. You know, I just, I just look. I, I, I look at my colleagues. I see what they do. But I don't feel the need of doing something myself and getting the attention. You know, mm-hmm. that's, that, that's the difference. So... Uh, I, I like it. It's when when I'm re- releasing an album, it's a, it's a blessing, you know. It's, yeah. We use it, we promote the heck out of it, and it's good for us. But uh, when it comes to my personal stuff, I don't like it at all. You know, I don't like anything for, for, um, for me personally to be there, right? And give people screen time because you're a private dude like that. Well, <laughs> I mean, so so now that you mentioned like the attention stuff. 
how how have you managed to like because i'm sure listen you're a good looking dude you're very like extroverted on stage I um yeah you, you still are don't <laughs> worry you still are um and so my question is like how did you not let that get to your head you know knowing that like you are this like heartthrob you know that literally millions of girls and stuff they they you know they're attracted to you how do how, how do you like balance like not letting it get to your head or has it ever gotten to your head? Do you ever think that you were egotistical? Do you ever think that you kind of like just thought that you were like the shit just because of that? Like, how did you, cause I feel like, uh, that's what, that's what celebrity status does to people. Like I, I would, I don't even hate anybody for having their ego boosted, how, but, but the question is how were you able to kind of balance it and not let it get to the point where it affects your career negatively, if at all, you just put, you just don't put yourself out there. Hmm because fake comments and these things that are just blowing your horn will be out there. You just don't put it, put, put yourself out there, you know, just not to get, let it get in your head. Right. You know, uh, that's, that's the only thing because you know that there's different agendas behind it. I, the, the people that I care about will tell me they love me either way without me being in social media or not. That's the one that cares that, that those are the one I, I care about. Those are the ones that matter. Right. But um, re- more than that, I just I don't see I don't see any reason I don't I don't see any reason to so so you have you have a small support because you have to remember you have you have to remember um before me being famous or being me even being a singer I had a lot of friends I was pretty popular I was you know, you know what I mean I never had that I never became a singer to get girls or be, become right. popular you know what I mean I always had the friend I was always me and my guitar I always was the center of attention I have a tattoo that means the center of attention I got it when I was 16 years old so <laughs> <laughs> that's my personality so if if anything i'm running away from it just to have my private life yeah and, and actually like i i was watching this amazing uh interview that you had with airfon and afro i had never seen it before but like as i was trying to kind of catch up on you know where you've talked recently which i noticed that's that the you... last interview but I've, I've done by, by I, I know man <laughs> and, and, and and that's why i love it that's why i love and appreciate you for for doing this so it means a lot thank you but like you know what what i first of all, what i loved about that interview and damish and gamma they did a great job uh mm-hmm. i i hope that they continue that podcast because i know they haven't Shout done like to any... yaya and airfon too yeah man amazing ama- amazing podcast amazing quality that's great that they did that and um but what i loved about you in that interview is that you were so raw you know and and one thing that you talked about actually is is something that's near and dear to me and that is like people getting bullied too much and you had mentioned that at a very young age you were being bullied at all because because of your uh being like skinny and stuff so i would love it if you could uh not just share some of those experiences but then if you have any advice from other people that are in those very very fragile years like the teenage years are so freaking hard you know so on one hand share experience that happened to you and second what advice you have for other people who are going home crying because you know they're getting bullied and stuff if you have any advice for them i would really appreciate you sharing your insight well um imagine this demand uh I moved to Sweden when I was six years old and I moved to Sweden back in the days, they were all blonde and blue eyed. And I immediately went to a preschool that I was the only guy, only child with a, with black hair and black eyes. So immediately you're the black duck and there's all these uh, gold chiclets. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> so immediately you're the only one and positive and negative it has all these positive sides that's yours you stand out of course yeah and there's all and you stand out that has the negative negative aspect to it too so growing up i'm always battling with this because you can't change your change your skin tone you can't change your or be nicer it won't change so however nice you are they still have these these um pre-assumptions from you you're right right So, so that it doesn't it starts before even getting bullied because you you feel less because you're the one your minority you're one and there are many so you feel less just to begin with you know so um as 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 a, as you grow up then this uh, so it it affects you you know what i mean if it affects you in your in your relationships but the will the, the way to deal with it is that um like when you get older i'm almost 40 years old and it's, this this happened maybe 35 yeah 30 30 years ago right mm-hmm. so when you look at it there is it's just like a movie you know it's like a spider-man movie these scenes are all have to be there this is a it's part of the hero's journey 
You know what right. I mean? That's just part, part of a hero's journey. You have to go through this in different aspects of life. Some people go through it in the beginning. Some people get bullied later, but you have to build yourself up that you have to go through. Like I've walked scared for like blocks with people following me back in Sweden. And every step of that, I, I even after 25, 30 years, I, every step of that walk, I've, I, I remember what I thought to myself, what I told myself and how I, how I went through it. And miraculous, miraculously, nothing happened to me and I end up, end up coming home. But I was scared every single, every single step of the way from the bus to my house. So did you, did, I, you al- did you always, sorry to cut you off, but did you always feel the need to like, just say, like, are, are you the kind of person that had to like, did you do a lot of fights in like high school and college? Not or? at all. I've never been no. in a fight. I've never been in a fight. So like how, how how would that experience like affect you like it just like like I'm just trying to get an idea of like you have to be smooth you have to be smooth like you have to, you really have to be smooth like there's there 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 was times that I had to like when people were following me I had to pretend that I know somebody and like oh uncle uncle there you are so that they thought I saw my uncle and they would just run away you know what I mean because at at some point it was just me and dad in Sweden and and I didn't have anybody. Right. So you have to be smooth in life. And even even today, you have to pick your pick and choose your battles. And that's 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 what I think I did good. I love it, man. So <laughs> so another thing that you were talking in that interview that I want to follow up now, because it's been about three, four years since you had the interview, is that there, there seemed to have been a time three, four years ago where you were still just trying to you were trying to figure yourself out. And I know there was also a, a period of sobriety. Still going on, man. It's still going on. I still haven't figured it out. A, a, apparently, it's a lifelong process, right? Yes. But, but what is like, I, I guess what I want to know is that if you could go back to the starting line of when you started your career um, and you look at it as this long race and today is where we are in the race, if you could do a whole redo, uh-huh. What would you do differently? Like, is there like, would you, the way that you would put on your shoes, the way that you would lace them up, the way that you would go with the mindset, like, what have you learned that if you could go back again, that you would navigate this whole race in a completely different way, if at all? I don't think there would be much. I don't think it would be much. Um, thinking of this, uh, of the circumstances that's been, and me again, us being in exile, like, I, I wish, I wish we would live in a, another country and I would, from the age 16, when I knew what I was gonna do, there were certain ways to do it. There was, you know, I had to, I had to spend from age 16 in Stockholm to 21 just to get to US and come to LA to meet some people. Right. So that's, that's lost time for me. I knew I was gonna be a singer or an artist at age 16, but I fought every day to get my stuff done and get my visa and get stuff and get financially so something get together to right. get to LA and meet some people. Fortunately, it went very fast for me. Like <laughs> I think the first week in LA, I joined Black Cats. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah. Yes. So 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 actually, I was actually gonna say like I'm assuming that it was the Black Cats that that brought you into there. Would it you was just... actually Amon Asmo that brought me. <laughs> it was that song. I recorded that song in Sweden. That's and... why, that's why you need a music video for that damn song. Yeah. <laughs> so so that that it's that's the one. Six. That's so that's the one that basically caught on fire. Like at that moment, like doors opened for you, huh? It was that song. Basically, yeah, people listened to it. And uh, there was a BO2, I don't know if you remember, BO2 yeah. website that we had, we put it on BO2 and it just got traction. And yeah. people knew me, like people knew, oh, you didn't, you didn't Sammy. And don't forget the business was not like this. Like yeah. there was, there was our mainstream singers and then maybe two, three other ones. Maybe oh, yeah. one from Iran, maybe it was Aryan band from Iran. <laughs> you know, that's, that's the time. Yeah, Shotmer and that was Shot it. Shotmer and Aria band, yeah. So yeah. That, that that was the time. So when that song when that song came came out, I decided to do it and like I said it took me like maybe 6 7 years to get to get to you guys. So the Amona Asma when you wrote it, did you think that this is your breakout song or did it catch Not you on surprise? I was just experimenting with writing. That was actually my first song or second song I wrote. <laughs> I love that. I was and- just experimenting. 
Um, so leading on to this whole Amaras Mall and Black Cats, uh, would you say that that was the right stepping stone? Like, are you happy with the journey you took where you started off as like the group Black Cats and oh, then came sure. solo? Yeah, yeah, for sure. For sure. Okay. I, I'm, I'm happy with joining. I'm happy with leaving. <laughs> I'm happy with everything. Um, yeah, I, I, I did what I had to do. Don't, 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 don't forget. I'm a solo yeah. person. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, it's just me. So I had right. to navigate my ways. I right. had to move move to Dubai for three, four years and not even release a song. And then I have to reinvent myself with a bunch of new friends, with a bunch of new new guys. We we made a new record label. Yeah. We did so started from scratch. King Records. I yeah. remember King Records. No, yeah. for the, the first one was Emma, EMA. Oh, that's right. Sorry. Yeah. 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 Right. <laughs> so and Iman, still today I'm I'm doing the same. Like still today, I we I, we're, we're doing something till na- uh, last year. You remember. We were about to do some stuff together. Yeah, even. Right. And then COVID hit. And then COVID hit. And I was already on tour. So I haven't gone home to, to Toronto for, for a year. Right. I haven't been able to go home. So we're we just reinventing ourselves and our, our stuff again and again and again. And I'm building a new studio at home. So because there's nowhere to record. Yeah. So from scratch, I'm building a studio at home to, to start doing the new album. So... I mean, you, you just basically alluded to it where you basically just caught on fire like a forest fire, you know, and like, um, I feel like you went from zero to 180 miles per hour, literally overnight, you know, like me and everybody in DC, Puria, Massey, we all knew the potential. And I still freaking remember when Puria called me, he's like, hey, guess what? Sammy is part of Black Cats now. He's like, but don't tell anybody, you know, but like yeah. it, it happened very quick. Like it, it I, I mean, I know you worked your ass off and it took a long time because from the moment you got on stage and performed at 14, there was a big period. So I know you worked hard, but as far as like presenting yourself and catching on fire, it was very quick. And one of your fans uh, messaged me and wanted me to ask a question that kind of ties into this because like I said, you went very famous very fast, but she was saying that if there was a time where he felt that every single door was close to him, and if he felt he would never make it as an artist, how did he push himself to keep on trying and not give up? Did he give himself a time limit to reach his goal? So obviously your your period was very short, but if there is somebody out there, which is many artists that are trying hard, how, what what type of advice or opinion or or guidance can you give the ones that are trying so hard and they still believe they can make it? Do you have any advice for them? Um, first of all, you have to be realistic, Iman. Just because I was gonna answer something else, but this second the last part of your question maybe made me answer my change my question <laughs> because you were like. To people that think they can make it, you have to be realistic. I don't right. even think I can make it right now. Oh, you wow. have to be, yes. You have to be, you ha- I don't really, you know, not that I don't think I can make it, like I'm really trying to make it right now. I don't think, I, I don't know I can make it. You have to go in the process and the process has to be so valuable for you that you have to you go through anything for it. Even, even if it doesn't go well, you know what I mean? Even if it doesn't go well. Right. Like with this pandemic, like it it opened oh, opened up a lot of people's eyes. Like, what is this I'm doing? Like, what am I doing? What if I can't go on? St- this is a pandemic now. What if I can't I can't go on stage next year? Yeah. You know what I mean? And then you think, okay, maybe I should do this. Maybe I should do that. Maybe I should change career. Maybe okay, I haven't done anything for eight months. Maybe I should focus on something else. Maybe opening a store. Or do something else but there's people like me that say no 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 this is what you're doing regardless of what happens you're going to go with on stage with one leg you go with one leg you go whatever happens you're still going on stage until you can and when you can't then you deal with it so it's one thing that keeps keeps you from giving up is that knowing this is the way that i any way you choose any any path that you choose it has to be your only last chance you can't have run run runaways You you can't have like Okay, I'm not gonna do it. Okay, Plan B. Some in some stuff, some stuff. Plan B's doesn't work. So, my advice to people: if it's your Plan A, regardless if you make it or not, just do it. Don't let yeah. that be your goal. Making it shouldn't be your goal. Right. Give it. Give it your all, basically. And if it doesn't pan out the way you hoped, you then should accept love some. It. You should love something that much that even if you don't make it, you you're happy doing it. Yeah. 
So, so you mentioned this whole, you know, issue with what artists are facing right now, not having been on stage for 10, 11 months and not knowing, you know, what are we going to do now to make money? So as an artist, what are, what are you doing more or less of since the pandemic that you weren't doing before the pandemic? Are you writing more? Are you, are you playing more music? Are you taking a chill pill? Like what's, what, what's, what, how have you been handling the pandemic? I'm just taking the chill pill. I'm not taking, putting too much pressure on myself. If I want to write for three days, I write for three days. If the world is on, on hold, who am I to push it? You know what I mean? It's just everything is telling you to stay at home and do nothing. So why am I going to push it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's the I'm, thing. But doesn't mean that you don't, have, you don't have to think. Doesn't mean that I'm shutting off my brain. Doesn't mean that I'm, I'm careless about stuff. Doesn't mean that I'm letting myself go. Yeah. Uh, it's not that, but it's just taking a chill pill and it's just just chilling. I'm doing some new businesses. I'm uh, I'm working on some some new stuff that's that I like. Not even for for to, to make money or for to do something. I'm just doing something that I like. Experimenting. Starting a new business. Yeah, stuff like that. You know, because uh, like I started the Awesome People podcast during quarantine because obviously when everything was shut down for me as an entertainment company owner, I was like, you know what? I've always wanted to make a podcast. And so I had a lot of great conversations with people during quarantine. And I was of the mindset that, man, when this pandemic is over, some of the greatest music, some of the greatest artistic performances are going to come out because true artists are going to use this time as the opportunity to get in the cave and just come up with some creative shit. So would, would you say that like the pandemic has motivated you a little bit more or has it like, you know, has it lit some kind of fire at all in your, in your opinion or no, it's just a pause and you're going to continue going to rock it. No. Yeah, for sure. Because it just, just gets, keeps, keeps you active. I've been, I, like I said, I was on tour and I couldn't go home. So I had to just improvise, just improvising, living, just uh, just finding it's a labyrinth. You just have to find your path. Okay, this day, wait, wait, this door didn't open. Let's, let's try another, another one. So right. a pandemic or not pandemic, I think you're it just, we're physically, we're limited right now, but mentally we're not, we're not limited. I love that, man. You never, you're, ne you're never limited mentally, honestly. Like creativity has no boundaries. So, uh, and again, I, you'd be surprised. Actually, you probably know, but a lot of people don't know that you write all your songs, that you write all the music. Um, they just kind of look at you as a good-looking pop star, just kind of gets on stage. But it's they're hard. just, yeah, no, I know. So, but I, what I want to know is that personally. Do you love the performance in front of thousands of people more? Do you love the writing of the lyrics more? Do you love the making of the music? Which part of your craft do you love the most that you dedicate the most amount of time to? The performance. The performance. Yes, the performance. Uh, I, I just, I love the performance. I write my songs visualizing how I'm going to perform them on, them on stage. And that's maybe, that's what maybe separates me from a lot of people is that that's why it takes so 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 long for me to make to make a song because I don't want to release something that I don't enjoy performing and people will not sing to me every every song. Man, what a great answer! So so that that actually would probably explain that this really is hurting you even more. The fact that you're not able to be on stage and get that performance high that you you know get and that you yearn for, right? So that that kind of yeah. makes it even 10 times harder, man. So that's why I hope you get it back on stage very quickly. So um, the, the next follow-up I have to this whole performance aspect is, um, do, do you, um, man, I just lost my train of thought for a second, but I, what, what I wanted to ask you is, do, do you think that your whole purpose is to entertain? Like, is that literally like what you feel like you were born to do? Do you ever think about life as far as like, what is the meaning? What is the purpose? And if so, would you say that you're on track or you're still in pursuit of it? Well, this past year has been an eye opener. Uh, I think I think my perception has changed maybe 50% for, for the past year, just me losing, losing people close to me. Like these uh, tragedies, like I don't think anything is worth it. Anything is worth your well-being and this thing that you have to feel good first, just for your health first and for people around you. Uh, so my, my, I think my, my purpose is just to be, be good and try to be healthy and not hurt myself or hurt people around me and just, just be good energy. You know, that's the only thing I don't think find, like we, we, this all got proven to us this year that 
no amount of money is worth it. <laughs> Nothing is worth it. Like I know people that lost so much money and they're still happy. And I know people that just they're miserable just because they're not working. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like right. th these these things, it just put, puts it to, to, to perspective that even the one that you think is very happy can be miserable. And even the one that is miserable has some things to be happy about. And that's their health. Uh, we're all healthy. Thank God we, we might be inactive a year, might be active another year. Like I had years that I did like 40 shows a year. I wasn't complaining then. So why am I complaining now? <laughs> Bebe, uh, Sammy, like, do you... Um... Do you recall the last time that you were like in a very dark place and just like you just felt like nothing is going your way? And if that was the case, what what does Sammy Beggy do to pick himself up, to motivate himself, to, um, you know, just have that like mojo back, you know, because I, I, I feel as though every single human being has their ebbs and flows, you know, but um, if you have some word of advice on what has worked for you to get back on track, do you have anything you'd like to share? It just takes time, time, time and change of environment. You can't force it. Like this is like, like you said, it's a natural, natural circle and pulse of life. It's like ups and downs. It's the wave like some people is longer. Some people are shorter. It's like a period of hibernation. So mm. it just has, you have to have, just have, give it time. That's what I do. Like I have, I have some days that trust me. And it's very hard. It's like some people like had to shut off for like a few days. Just do it. It's your way. Some people shut off. I take I take three four days just to shut off. I don't talk to anybody. I might not even eat. <laughs> like I have days that I I just don't feel like eating even. Mm -hmm. I I can go two three days without eating or I just drink water and I I'm just by myself thinking. And it's up. It's okay to be down, you know. And mental health is. It's ups and downs. It's just okay, okay to be to to feel bad sometimes. And trust me, I'm, it happens a lot. But you just have you have, just have to write it. Do you, do you sometimes feel pressure to release a song soon just because like your fans they're constantly asking when's the next song? Like does that get tiring? Yes, constantly, constantly. And I want to tell them from here. <laughs> <laughs> you need. The pressure is not gonna get to me. The songs are gonna come when they come. I'm not gonna release bad music just because I get pressured. No, that's that, that's why Fair I love enough. them too. That's why that's why I, this is the thing. This is an indication that this is wor working because they wouldn't ask for it. They would say, okay, yeah. it's not releasing that, but they want when they are still asking for it. That means it's it's happening. And trust me, I I I was off. I was I didn't release uh, songs for two years and I released the album. So I gave them eight songs. Now it's been maybe two years and the next well, next album is coming out. There's going to yeah. be 10 more new songs. So I don't do singles, but when they come, they come. <laughs> and, and you know what? I think that true fans, they respect their artists enough to know that art is not created overnight with a snap of a finger, that there's a process and that artists needs to be in the right mindset to do it. So I have no doubt that your true loyal fans, they, they respect that about you. The fact that you're not just trying to put out quantity, which unfortunately a lot of artists, they do, you're putting out quality. And that's why literally everything you put out is always quality. It might, they might not all be top 10 on the charts, but they're made with love. They're made with like, with, with, with thought, with process. And uh, what, just one of the things that I just want everybody to know about you is the fact that you are the singer, the writer, the, the, the magician behind it, you know, and not just a, a face on stage. So keep, keep on doing what you're doing, man, and put out the music at your pace because it's working for you. But speaking of music, there are two people that are asking online what your favorite song mm -hmm. is to perform. Do you have a certain song that you love to perform? Uh, like I said, I, I, I write all the songs to, to perform them. So, um, I like, I like all of them, but usually it's, it's not what song I play. It's when I play it. So usually the first song that I play is usually my favorite. Whatever Which, song it is, the opening song that we do just because uh, of the energy is always my favorite. Song. All right, all right. Yeah, I mean, I rem I remember when you performed in DC. It was it was a 2014, the one we did with Tehran, the Cafe Asia, and um, it was it was, HMG had just came out, so that's the one that you walked into at that point. Yeah, usually and, we do the the latest song we open with that. So yeah, um, I love all of them. 
Yeah, man. So, and, and by the way, for those of you who are going to watch the rest of the interview all the way to the end, we're going to go ahead and play the highlight video from the night that Sammy Beg, you rock DC. So make sure you stay all the way to the end and enjoy that amazing uh, video uh, and, and performance. So um, the other question that I wanted to ask you is um, a couple of weeks ago on Facebook, I, I posed the question and I asked people that if there's one topic that you would talk for 20 minutes about uh, without having to prepare, but it's something that you're passionate about. What topic would Sammy Beggy choose to talk about from like the bottom of his heart? Uh, just being real, man. Just being real. And uh, appreciating people that are real. And uh, yeah, just because just to don't lie to yourself. I think we're so much caught up in watching and consuming people's lies that we lie to ourselves even mm -hmm. and that's that's i think that's affecting us that's affecting our confidence to each other that's affecting our decisions uh just be real just know your flaws admit your flaws uh this uh, keep your word mm -hmm. these are the things that i think i i would talk about for people to do not because the way they're going to treat people but how it affects themselves how you feel better with your own life when you do these things when when you keep your word when you don't lie when you uh i don't just just not cliche things but just keep it in real lie lie when you think you have to lie but right. don't lie for when it doesn't represent you lie if it rep represents you lie if you can't stand for the live afterwards and say you know what i did this i lied yes i had to lie do you, do you how how would you judge um the persian entertainment industry as somebody that's been in this field now for i think 15 years i believe um how can we improve i mean i i come from a place where i've obviously been the promoter you know i i do i've always done it for cultural reasons i wanted to bring the community together you know like i never really cared about being a promoter and doing concerts and making money i always looked at it as a way to bring people together i felt like uh every iranian has an obligation to preserve our culture preserve our music uh and you know and just kind of bring people together so i've i've never even though people used to call me promoter i didn't like that because like some people literally that's all they want to do they want to go and promote and be like uh, managers and whatever i was like dude i just want to get people together have a great time you know uh how can the persian entertainment industry improve so that artists like you are able to really perform with ease because all you really want to do is just perform you know you don't want to deal with this bullshit that happens with all the business side of it shady uh, managers shady promoters how can we improve so if there's other people who are thinking about preserving our music preserving our artists and keeping this torch alive which i feel like is an obligation that we have what can we on this side do better to make sure you guys perform better and do better and are happier which is a benefit for everybody well i think it's it's about a mutual respect I think you have people have to respect the artists and the artist has to respect the promoters and the people that perform for mm -hmm. uh, that. Unfortunately, that's that's been the thing for the past uh, decade or so, because uh, as again, it's nobody's fault. We're not in our own country. Like I can I, if I tell you something, it's good. It's just going to. It's just going to be for for the US and it's good. Other things are gonna go for people in Germany or the promoters in Sweden or pro promoters. We we don't we don't have a we don't have one rule and one standard to go through. So I can't tell you. I might tell you, okay, don't get banquet halls, get have concert halls, and that that doesn't that doesn't go for Germany, but mm -hmm. that doesn't go for another other state. So what I can say is just respect each other, give each other good products, give each other good service. Like I don't understand why our ticket. Ticket prices has to be so low in the Persian market. That's because we don't give people what they what they deserve, and we can't charge for it. That's why I, uh, that right. this is the discussion I had with you when you you were doing my concert. I'm like, oh my God. I don't want my prices to be this low. Have the prices yeah. are high, I will deliver so that people don't think that they overpaid yeah. for this concert. Yeah, no, and it's I actually experience. I, I, You're selling experience. Dog, dog. I I totally I remember that conversation, and it was very frustrating for me because. 
and it, and, and, it, and it cost me a lot, but like I cared so much about quality that mm -hmm. I kept on trying my best to provide quality. But then because the community had experienced so many bad experiences from other organizers, like they don't know the difference between Iman and Asghar and Hussein. All they know is that Yen Afar is having a concert, Vahame Concert Iruni. They're like bad places, bad sound, bad lighting, bad whatever. And then we who want to do quality and we need to charge higher to cover the cost of yeah. a great artist and great venue, we get the short end of the stick because people have had bad experiences, you know? So that's also been like a, a really um, challenging part from the organizer standpoint is the fact that other people have screwed it up for us, you know, and we can't even try to make up for that. So um, but I, we never had this problem because uh, thank, thankfully my audience has been always good that we never had the pricing problem. They always know that, that, that that's my thing. I want True. to take people that respect my music and they're ready, ready to, to pay for it. Um, yeah, no, man. And I, and I, and I'm very bummed that we haven't been able to do that show since 2014, because I know the DC area has been craving for you to come back over there. So I hope that after the pandemic, we can make it happen. We, um, have, a, we have a, we have a U.S. tour coming right after the pandemic. Uh, I'm not gonna travel anywhere. I'm just gonna focus on the, on on the U.S. and we're go, we're doing I think 15 cities. Uh, right. So as as soon as it's done, um, I'll be seeing everybody all over U.S. That's amazing, man. I think your fans are gonna love the fact that you just said that. Uh, I was trying to avoid the basic questions of like, when is your next song coming out? When do we expect to see you? But the fact that you brought it up, man, I'm 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 happy to hear that. Uh, you, I hope you have DC and Miami on part of that tour. Oh, so that for we can, sure, yeah. We, we no, can, but we're we can... specifically working on we're working on the U.S. tour because uh, I know that the pandemic has hit U.S. very very hard, and uh, I know there's a lot of Persians here, uh, different different states, different cities. Yeah, and I'm about to focus on them for the next year. Awesome. Um, so, someone, I have a, I have a question for you, man. Not, well, let me tell you to you like this. One of the things that really, really saddens me a lot is people that are going through depression, people that are going through some really, really difficult time, and um, so many people they literally lose their life or they take their life for for something that could be easily fixed with somebody being by their side listening to them consoling them and just you know giving them some kind of like some, just some positivity you know and i if you have anything that you do as far as self care taking care of your mind your body your soul so that you have equilibrium in your life um I would love for you to share any advice that you have. So if anybody is going through a difficult time right now, that they hopefully will latch on to your words and that they pick themselves up and they, they march forward in a positive light. Do you have something you can share? Well, um, it's again the, the same thing that I, I pointed to before is that everybody goes through it. And I, for people who would think that I don't go through it, they're very wrong. Or if I think that you don't go through it, uh, I'm, I'm mistaken. So right. people might think, oh, this is, I think it's so uh, basically stupid to say, oh, why would you, you're Sammy Beggy, why would you feel down? Why would you have suicide thoughts? Or why would you have this? Or why would you think about hurting yourself? Why would you think it's the end? Why would you think there's no other way around? Why would you be down and negative? Because it's because I'm human. <laughs> And this happens to everybody. And um, for me, I talk to people. I talk to people and I'm, I'm, I'm very frank about it. Like I can call people and say, you know what, what? I'm not feeling well. And this is, these, 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 these are the thoughts I have. And the people I choose to talk to, they basically know how to handle it. They might just come and, come and get me and go somewhere. They just might just be around me or so, somehow, but talk about it, talk about it and just let it out. If you feel that whatever you feel, talk to someone. There's always somebody to talk about, talk, talk to. And even though you can open open doors by talking to somebody about it, like you can show your vulnerability and talk to somebody about it. Maybe so you maybe somebody will talk to you about it. And you, you know what? I'm feeling the same way. Maybe you can help each other, but talk about it and be open about it. That's the only thing I can say. Don't self-medicate. <laughs> Don't do, don't do this kind of stuff. You can party to have fun, but don't self-medicate to run away from stuff. Don't run away from your feelings and thoughts. That's the only thing I can say. Have you ever considered taking your life? Uh, sure, of course. 
Yeah. How, like every, how, it's this it's this moments it's this moments like it's this moments of emptiness you feel sometimes and you just like if if it, if it wasn't for the people around me and how it affect them you feel sometimes that empty that there's no place for you to be be anymore and then i think it's it's not serious but it's i think it's normal for everybody to think well, oh i'm going to i'm going to do this i'm going to do that i'm going to like bang my head against the wall i'm going to do this so there's, there's times that you feel like that and it's totally normal but like I said, you talk about it. I don't feel ashamed of saying it. I'm, I don't feel ashamed of calling my best friend and saying I'm having a really bad day or I'm having these thoughts. So I made it through. Uh, Sammy, I'm 100% certain that one person listening to this, you just saved their life by sharing something so vulnerable, oh, so sure. raw. And and I appreciate that about you. And um, this this whole fame thing, this whole having a few million people around you that um, they adore you and they love you and they're just like, they're all about you. Um, is that is that what you, is it what you expected beforehand? Like how much did that affect you when you went from being unknown Sammy Beggy to the, one of the biggest pop stars in, on, the, on the planet? How like, what do you, what do you think about it? How do you, what, how do you feel about that? I actually was expecting to enjoy it more. Elaborate. Uh, I was expecting to enjoy the fame and the hype and the being out there more. But the more I got into into it, I saw the uh, the damages they it could do to me, and it wasn't worth it for me anymore. Uh, like being in the being in the eye, not having a private life. It wasn't worth it, worth it for me. I thought I would enjoy it. I thought I would enjoy being out, going out, being in the eye, uh, being Sammy Beggy. But when I came, especially in LA, uh, the scene when I was start was, was first started. The scene was so bad that I immediately got cold feet, cold feet, and I dragged myself out. There was so much drama behind it. Like you couldn't go out because you were in black hats, a party because. They would tell, oh, this guy's out partying. So what? He's out partying. You know, this culture wasn't the same right before. So I got I got so hurt by that, just being myself. So I thought, you know what? I'm not gonna go out anymore. I'm not gonna enjoy that part of it because it can hurt me so much. I'm just out partying, but I'm coming home. People think thinking I'm passed out in a club and it's affecting my career when I didn't do anything, when I was just doing doing my my regular thing, and it would actually affect it because people would judge. Oh, he's this, he's that, he's doing drugs. So you know what? I'm not going out because no, I don't want anybody to see me drunk. I don't want you know. You drink, you get tipsy. I'm, I'm, I'm a, I'm a human. I can, you yeah. know, I can sit somewhere and I'd be get tipsy. But immediately that would be something else for me. So I, I stopped going out and it didn't affect me. I was like, this is not what I want. I just want to do my music. I want to go that one night in month or one night every other month that I have a concert. I go all out, I party, I have a concert and I come home and I'm home again until I have to go on stage again. So just, I didn't let it affect me, the the, the hype, because it's really, it, it can harm, harm a, a, a person. Like you don't know when, you, when you're gonna get drunk, right? You go out one night and you won't drink too much, two drink two drinks too much. Thank God, you know, I, had, I don't drink for the past 15 years, <laughs> so. One drink too much, two drinks too much. Something happens and then everybody's got to judge you. You're a bad person because of that one incident and people are not going to respect you as an artist no more. What kind of, what is that? Did, did all of this ever push you to just be like, you know what, fuck it, man. I'm done with this thing. It's just not, not the music. No, not the no. music. No, I, I gave up the other aspect of it, but I'm still in my house doing music and I do my concerts. I take it. Uh, I take a plane to the city that I, I want to perform and I'm out next day because I have to make a living. This is what I do. Is there, is there like a part of you that kind of wishes that you didn't get famous so that you can actually for once live a normal life? Because I feel like from a very young age, from what you explained earlier, growing up in Sweden, being the, the, the black duck, you know, or like the, the one that was st standing out, meaning like never really fitting in, not even being able to kind of grow into yourself. And just as when you were trying to become yourself, you became famous and then you weren't able to be yourself because you're under the microscope. So like, is it sort of like you're still kind of hoping to find 
the space where you can just be 100% yourself without any kind of judgment, but still do what you love the most, which is to create amazing music and make people dance? Well, I think I am there now. I'm, I'm, I'm there in the comfort of my home. Nice. Yeah, that's what I do. I, and I think I'm there outside my home too, because I'm, I'm, I'm just myself. I don't try to fit in, fit in anywhere. But if I had to choose something else to do, then I had to be another person. Because I don't think what that would be. Um, right now I'm doing other stuff, but this still I'm doing. I'm I'm using the same techniques that I was using my music business in my other businesses. So I think this was a this was just a, because me growing up as an outcast. This was the natural way for me to to come, and me not blending in with the industry. That's another aspect of it coming up. Yeah, so so you basically like you were groomed to handle the pandemic in many ways, of all the that's of why, all the artists. <laughs> that's why my mother said in the beginning last last year, uh, she called me and like, okay, now everybody has to learn to live like you. <laughs> <laughs> I love that man. So um, I, I want to try to ask you a couple of random questions before I wrap it up, man. I want I know you have some guests over too, so I don't want to keep you from that party. But um, I actually have a meeting. Uh, I actually have had a business meeting for our new uh, CBD products that we're doing outside. And uh, oh, do you do you want to <laughs> give do you want to give a further plug about the CBD product? Oh, for sure. Yeah, we could do that. Go ahead. Uh, so basically, it's my my new CBD company that I'm doing. It's a uh, uh, the Eight Specs Trust Fee CBD. I don't know. I'm sure people in US know the CBD and the benefits of the CBD, but oh, yeah. I think uh, I think uh, we needed we needed somebody to introduce it to the Persian community for our elderly for for our uh, anybody that's dealing with anxiety they can't sleep pains every anything I use it myself uh, all the time uh, so I thought it's a good product it's something that we we need it's an alternative kind of medicine I know there's a lot of people into opioids right now that we're just using it for pain. Yeah. It can help them a lot. It can help with anxiety, with sleeping, sleeping problems. So uh, we're going to go more more through it once we launch, but it's coming. Man, so, I mean, I, I love the fact that you do that because obviously there's this stigma about it in the Persian culture. So the fact that you're doing this is a huge step forward. And the benefits are very well documented too, you know. But so it's just a matter of breaking through that barrier. And I, I love the fact that you're doing that because you can truly help heal uh, people with this. So what, what is yeah, it? Uh, Sabs CBD, S A B Z, as in green. Sabs CBD. All right. Uh, yeah. So I thought uh, I might be a good gateway for for Iranians to get to get to know this because I I know a lot of people that have benefits from it. Uh, my my friends' uh, parents are using it. <laughs> they're vaping it. <laughs> so uh, and they're 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 getting rid of all kinds of pains and inflammations. And I think it's a good thing. And I've talked to a, a few doctors that I have on board and. I'm, Maybe you can talk to one of them soon. Um, yeah, for sure. It's, uh, so yeah, it's just something that I really look forward to. And I really just this aspect of, because uh, um, I have chronic pain myself uh, and it helped me a lot. And I just love for people to wake up with pain, without pain. Without pain, <laughs> I was like, without pain. <laughs> with pain, without pain. So, so you couldn't call it Qorma Sabs? I'm just yeah, well, it didn't have to be Gorma Sab Z. <laughs> I had to do that corny joke or else it wouldn't have been a complete episode. Uh, but, uh, no, that's amazing, man. So when, when can people expect to get it and how is it going to be distributed? Like, is that out yet? When When is it going to come out? Um, we're actually um, doing the final stages of the branding right now. And yeah. once the branding is done, uh, it's going to be on uh, mykingdom.com. And uh, it's my website and people, people, the people I'm sure they know. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll do a full campaign on it. I just give you a little sneak peek of what I'm doing. Uh, yeah, I, I greatly appreciate it. And you can definitely count on me to spread the word about it. Um, you know, like there's a lot of cancer patients that are benefiting from the CBD. So I'm, I'm all about it. I have a dear family member in my household that is, is going through um, the challenges of cancer. And so like anything that can do to alleviate that pain, I'm all about it. I'm all about it. Sure, I'll send you some stuff. Thank you. I appreciate it. So um, before before I kind of wrap things up, there's a couple of things I want to uh, go over with you. One is when my dog of 16, 17 years, Meshki, passed away, 
I, I so greatly appreciated you sending me an audio message uh, that you had remembered Meshki from like 10 years ago. And so first of all, I, I thank you for even caring enough to message me that. But talk about the love that you have between uh, relationship with your dogs, Kilo and Solo. And just like, just, just, just talk about pets and the family and how important it is, man. Dude, I remember the day you got Meshki and I was, I, he was so cute. And I'm a dog lover, you know that. So I'm just... <laughs> I have yeah. a weak heart for dogs, and I remember how how black and fluffy it was, and I was like, "That's such a creative <laughs> name." I love the name Mishki. I'm like, "I I should I, I should have came up with that." <laughs> but uh, yeah, man, dogs are basically for the past seven years are, have been my my only companion. Like I'm home most of the time with my two dogs, and uh, they just uh, I love them, and I I try to plan my life around them i move because of them i stay in one country because of them they're just they're just priority number one right now yeah man unconditional love yeah. um and they're and not and, here i would i would i would bring them in they're, they're going out they went out for a walk so that they don't make a sound here next next time around they're, they're, what kind of pit bulls are, are they pit bull what, what kind of breed the are french they? bulldogs french bulldogs sorry not pit bull french bulldogs yeah, two boys um all right so my man the the last part of this uh, amazing conversation that I have the pleasure of having with you is I have this little segment at the end of every episode. It's called Veni, Vidi, Vici. I came, I saw, I conquered. I conquered, and, yes. You know, and so uh, for for somebody like you, who I genuinely believe that you've conquered the industry, you know, you've, you've made it to the top. Um, I want you to have, I know you're used to stages of thousands of people. This is your virtual stage for you to share anything that you would like to share with your fans, your 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 followers, your supporters, your friends, any kind of word of advice, any, anything that you would like to share on this virtual stage, it's all yours, my friend. I think um, I think we got a lot of lot of things and points said in this conversation, and I got my a lot of points through. Um, I don't like to talk about myself and what I do. I just <clears throat> not to like to talk to, to to the people that love me and tell them that I love them too. And just keep strong, man. No pressure. Just don't put pressure on yourself. Don't put pressure on me. <laughs> the songs will come. Valley, I love them. I love them from the bottom of my heart. And me being inactive on social media, don't see it as I'm being un- inactive. تو رو خدا تو رو خدا این سوشال میدیا تنها چیز نگاه نکنین there's more stuff to it there's other stuff uh, you, why don't you post why don't you do stories just chill don't do it yourself either whatever I can do to keep people from staring on their phone I will do it and I strongly advocate for it be with your family do different kind of stuff that's what I can say and I love you so much thank you for the opportunity for giving me a, so I can talk to you and my fans yeah, man. and that's it. I love it, man. No, I, honestly, like I, what you should do, honestly, if you don't want to do it right now, because I see a guitar back there, is you should get on <laughs> IG Live and you should play Amon Asma tonight. Whether it's if you want to grab it right, not to put pressure on you, but if you want to grab that guitar over there and do it, you should do it right now. If not, make your millions of fans happy and do IG Live and play your favorite song. That's my my little request, you know, in case you decide to follow on it, you know, but. Um, I'll do an IG live. What time is it in the run right now? Right now it's about eight thirty. Uh, they're eight and a half hours ahead, so eight. Yeah, it's six thirty in the morning, I think. Okay, I do. What time is it over there, East Coast? Uh, over here is ten p.m. Okay, twelve. All right, in two hours, IG live, ladies and gentlemen, you're about to have an incredible IG live performance with the one and only Sammy Beggy. Um, Dog, I, I really appreciate your time. I appreciate you. I love you, man. I, I really think that uh, the world is a better place when it has artists as pure, sincere, uh, genuine as you. And I have no doubt that you're going to continue rocking stages around the world. And hopefully one day we can have it in Iran where we can, uh, you know, enjoy your craft in front of millions of people, man. So uh, love you very much. And thank you for your time again, dude. Thank you. Thank you to all your listeners. And I love you all. Shabbat and Bechir. And ladies and gentlemen, uh, we're going to end this episode by playing the Sammy Beggy concert from Cafe Asia. Shout out to my boy Tehran. This is from DC in 2014. And to all the podcast listeners, uh, you're not going to see the visual, but enjoy the music. Enjoy the voice of the legendary Sammy Beggy. Good night, and thank you for joining us. Ciao, bella. Ciao, bella.